Thanks for joining me this afternoon for our study of Ezekiel. We had a problem with the recording yesterday, so I'm re-recording the one that you're watching today. Uh, in Ezekiel chapter 23, there's a long allegory about two sisters. One represents the northern kingdom, the other the southern kingdom. And we're now coming to the place where God says, now this is why I am judging you. So let me read it to you. It's Ezekiel chapter 23, beginning with verse 36. So he told Ezekiel to say to the northern and the southern kingdom, declare to them their abominable deeds. What were those abominable deeds? Well, they had committed adultery. That was the worship of idols and alliances with other nations. The blood is on their hands. Uh, they have with idols committed adultery. They've even offered up their children as food or sacrifices to the idols. Uh, moreover, they have defiled a sanctuary. Obviously, if this is anywhere near the temple, that is a horrible defiling of his, his home. They have profaned his Sabbaths. And he returns again, they've slaughtered their children for their idols. And then on the same day, they came into a sanctuary to profane it, he says. Then he goes on, this is what they did in my house. Let's take those items and think about them. And then in a minute, I'm going to apply them to our situation in the world in which we live. Now, there's a couple of things we can, we can just settle about God. Number one, uh, God is just and God doesn't just have a bad day and say, well, I think I'm going to make your life miserable because I'm having a bad day. Rather, when God brings judgment, it is because he has reason for that. Let's think about it. The word abominable came in there, and we think about maybe the abominable snowman, but this is not exactly that, is it? Abominable refers to something that is just entirely repulsive to God. Uh, and so what is repulsive to God? Well, there's some things that he lists in here. One of them is the worship of idols. Now, why is that so important? Well, God is holy and his people are to reflect his holiness. Let me read that to you. It comes out of the book of Leviticus, of one, one of many places. Speak to all the congregation. Say to them, you shall be holy for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. What does it mean for God to be holy? Holiness means to be other than the created order. God is the only being who stands outside of creation. Now, we obviously don't stand outside of creation. We are part of God's creation, but we are to be outside of the world's system. We're to be different. We're to be a different path. Jesus talked about narrow is the path and narrow is the way that we move in his kingdom. So we're to be different from that broad path of people who are on their way to destruction. God's people, instead of being holy, were just like the nations around them. They were to be an alternative. They were to reflect God's character. Instead, they didn't. Another aspect of God's character was that he always cares for other people. God is no respecter of person. He cares for everyone. Here's what Deuteronomy says. He, referring to God, executes justice for the orphan and the widow. He loves the strangers, providing them food and clothing. I'd like you to note that the orphan and the widow and the stranger, we could substitute the word immigrant in there, they are the most vulnerable people in society, and God loves them and cares for them. Here's the next verse. You shall also love the stranger, for you are strangers in the land of Egypt. So just as God cares for the most vulnerable, his people are to reflect that. When we get into the abominations, we're going to find out that instead of loving the strangers, the, the, the orphans, the widows, the immigrants, instead of loving them, uh, the powerful of the nation, just like the nations around them, we're oppressing them. So let's get into the four examples of the abominable things. 
all right? We talked about idols for a minute. In chapter 8, uh, God took Ezekiel on a tour of the temple. He was in Babylon, but God in a vision took him back to the temple and showed him what was going on there. The first thing he saw is the gate. If you can imagine a gate, and down at the end is the altar. But between the gate and the altar, there is an idol. He called it the idol of jealousy. When I was praying about that, studying chapter 8, I looked at my life and I said, God, between when I see that altar where I come to worship you, I have an altar there too. For me, unfortunately, the altar is my own self-will, my desire to please myself. You might want to think about, God, what do I have between where I am standing now and where I can meet you for worship? What is standing in the way and how can it be removed? Well, beside that, there were 70 of the key people who had taken over ruling the temple. Uh, people had been exiled to Babylon ahead of them, 597 BC. And they were in there now. And what were they doing? They were in little cubicles worshiping 70 different idols. And then there were women who were weeping for Tammuz. Uh, and then finally, there were more elders who had turned their back on God and they had turned it towards the sun god. Sun god was a representative of justice. And apparently they thought the sun god could give them more justice than the one who had delivered them from slavery in Egypt. That's an abomination. Not only was this taking place, but over the years, whenever either the northern kingdom or the southern kingdom formed a treaty with another country, they also signed a, a commitment to those who, that they had the treaty with. Part of that commitment was that they would worship and serve the idols or the gods of that land. So every time they had an alliance, it wasn't just that they were protecting their country in a military way. They were also saying to God, hey, we have to join ourselves to their idols also. You can imagine that was an abomination. Uh, chapter uh, 20, 23 uh, talks about the phrase, just, it just slides through there, blood on their hands. What does that mean? Well, in this instance, it's believed by the scholars that blood on their hands referred to judicial hearing. So you use the legal system to again do what? To oppress those who were less powerful. You had blood on your hands. We're told in the Bible that we are in prayer to lift up holy hands. Holy hands means God my hands are clean. I don't have blood on them. I have not used my power to harm someone else or to make life difficult for them. And then you had child sacrifice. And there's instances in Israel's history where King Manasseh actually instituted child sacrifice. It ended after he, after he ended his reign and there were some reforms put in place Again, it's believed by the scholars that didn't totally leave the land. And so, uh, you know, only God has the right to take a life. And, uh, and these people were taking a life of their children and offering them up to some sort of idol that they believed would give them what they thought they needed and they wanted. Now, the final abomination had to do with this. They had profaned the Sabbath. They had thought less of the Sabbath. When you think about the Sabbath, the Sabbath was God's gift to his people. Previously, there wasn't a day in the week of rest. There wasn't a seven day calendar where on the seventh day you got to take a rest. But when God instituted the Sabbath, they had a day of rest, which allowed them to refresh their lives. It also was a time where they renewed their commitment to God. You would think that we would want to renew our commitment to God at least once a week. Hopefully it would be every day. So th that's the history lesson. Now, I said at the very beginning of this little message that uh, God's just. He doesn't just have a bad day and say, I think I'm going to make life miserable for you. The reason why the judgment that we read about in Ezekiel is taking place, horrific judgment, is because it wasn't just for years, it was for decades 
for hundreds of years that his people had practiced the things I've talked about. And he had sent them prophets. He sent them difficult times, hard times on the land, and they seemed to never learn. And so he was going to bring the nation to rock bottom. We're going to hit the rock bottom in another chapter or so. And then Ezekiel is going to start on an upward swing of positive things about what God is going to do for the people. Now, before I stop, this is not just a history lesson. If, if this is prophetic words, we need to be like they weren't. We need to hear from the prophets. What are the prophets saying to us? Now, we don't offer our children as a sacrifice, but as a baby boomer, how have we sacrificed future generations? We need to ask that. What are we doing with the Sabbath? Are we profaning the Sabbath by treating it like any other day? Or are we using that seventh day to recommit our lives with, to God and to once again form that relationship with him? Hopefully that's an everyday thing. Do we have idols of the heart? Are you like me that between where you're standing and where God's place of worship is, you've got your self-will and your desires and your pleasures right in the middle? Well, if so, let's get that fixed. What do you say? Well, thanks for listening. Tomorrow you'll have the other guys back. Thank God for that. They're a whole lot easier than this. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Thank you for everybody who takes time to listen to these videos every day. Uh, Lord, we thank you for your goodness. Help us to hear what you're saying to us through the prophets and respond. We give you praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow.